Well, building off of um, David's talk, we're going to, and, and, you know, throughout the day for, for our audience, the, there's going to be some talks that, uh, that are, um, will stretch you a little bit. And then, and then some that, are, that'll be, you know, so there's kind of novice and, and, and expert types of talks. And, um, you know, don't be worried that there'll be a mix of each and, and you'll get what you get from, from, from them. This talk is going to be a, a little bit technical, but we'll, we'll try to keep it um, uh, accessible. So, um, so the first panel features my co-authors in a forthcoming book, The Mathematics of Innovation, which is going to be published by CRC Press Taylor Francis Group, and there are four Cornell University Systems Engineering doctoral candidates. And I'll just introduce them. You can see them on the screen one at a time. There's Graham Troxell, who's a, a candidate, a PhD candidate. They're all system science and engineering. Uh, Patrick Kastner, who's a candidate and in, in the environmental systems lab at Cornell. And then Christian Sprague, who's the senior data science fellow at Cornell Center for Social Science and also a systems PhD candidate in systems engineering. And Shang Wanxin, who is also a PhD candidate in systems engineering. And I will say that um, it is one of the great joys of teaching with uh, grad students who are smarter than oneself. Uh, so these four are truly exceptional people and exceptional minds. And it's great to work with them on, on our book. And our book is going to explore the analytical and synthetic power of, of structural predictions using these simple rules that we talked about in the morning, DSRP, in particular on innovation and discovery, as well as how these structural predictions might minimize cognitive biases and things like that. And as I spoke of this morning, DSRP structural predictions can be applied to everyday thinking. But in this panel, we'll discuss how it's been being applied at a kind of a slightly more advanced level and, and how we're writing about, about that. And just to put it in context, I'll tell a quick, simple story uh, that'll make it uh, uh, kind of give you a, a framework or a scaffolding to understand what we mean by structural predictions. I had a student that came to me, uh, it was literally at a dinner party and said, uh, you know, Dr. Cabrera, I wanna ask you about my dissertation. And, and she began, she wasn't my student, but she she was a student uh, actually from Harvard and and um, kind of began telling me all about her dissertation. It was a lot to take in, you know, it's, it's a lot of stuff. And so I'm trying to track what she's saying with my gin and tonic in hand. And, and, uh, and she's talking about uh, uh, election systems in India and, and she had two parties and was talking about the, the representatives, uh, the, the people and then the parties and um, and she was talking about how the one party related to the other to the people and then the other party related to the people. And at the end of her talking to me, I just said that, you know, that's really interesting. Uh, if I understand some of what you're talking about, I'm wondering about what is the, the dynamic between the two parties, right? Which to me was just sort of a triangle. You know, she was talking over and over again about three nodes. So the network she was dealing with was like three. And, you know, n times n to minus one tells me that, that, that uh, you know, there's three connections or uh, six two-way connections. Um, and so I simply asked her about that connection and, and she kind of paused and said, wow, that's exactly where I need to be looking. Like, how'd you do that? And I said, well, there were, three things and you only talked about two relationships. So I just asked a question about that third relationship. And that's what a structural prediction is. It's not, it's not terribly complex. Now, if you mix and match all these rules, you can get very, very complex structural predictions, but it really is just, a, a, you're, you're sort of highlighting that there should be some kind of structure there and you can ask a question about it. So. Um, that's sort of what we're uh, talking about. And so I'll get started with, um, with the panel in, a, in just a, a general discussion and, and feel free to put uh, questions in the Q&A and we can uh, add, add to those. But how can um, systems thinking help us address urgent social, political and technological challenges? 
Yeah, I'll kick that off, Derek. Um, thanks for having us. This is great. I really liked that talk by David, and I think this dovetails really nicely uh, his his talk into this conversation because your your follow up question to David on uh, what do we do now? You know, what are the how do we how do we absorb the findings that we have of systems into changing our behavior? How do we get that systems perspective, and then how do we use that to uh, change or alter our uh, the way we're interacting with the system and i think that you know to go back to your question on you know what is systems thinking good for <laughs> more or less you know it's getting that systems perspective it's being able to see the big problems that are facing us whether it's food shortage crises or structural systemic injustices global problems right we hear these phrases all the time in order to know how we need to adapt, in order to know how we need to change our individual behavior, we need to understand what the system is doing, take the system-centric perspective, to be able to see how it's encouraging us to behave, and then to ask the question, is that what we need to be doing, or do we need to change the interaction dynamics that we're, we're having? Yeah, that's a great, great idea. Any others on, on that one? Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> so this sort of a question, right, just, um, yeah, it makes me think of uh, Ashby's law of requisite variety, right, where, I mean, the sort of the central idea is that uh, a system needs to have at least as many numbers of states as, you know, or as some control apparatus needs to have at least as many number of states as the system it's trying to control for, right? And so we do need to take that systems level um, perspective and develop an understanding around it at that scale um, in order to really be able to uh, make an impact by uh, either changing it or adapting or whatever. Um, and so <clears throat> if you go, if you're, if the scale uh, that you adopt is too um, far above it or too far below it, you're going to miss some of the detail that's really necessary. Um, and so systems thinking uh, in particular, it kind of helps us hone in on the right level of scale and also helps us um, identify the things that really matter at that level of scale for the, that are leading to the sort of dynamics that we don't like or the things that we want to change. Yeah. And what do you what do you think the the mental models? I mean, the, the, this really kind of relates to mental models, right? Because we not only are we building a mental model of the system level behavior, but then we're we're relying on the mental models of the agents themselves, right? So, what role do mental models play in systems of all kinds, and also in particular in systems of innovation? Sure. Well, one of the things, um, again, kind of going back to uh, uh, David's talk, um, I think, uh, uh, Derek, you also mentioned this, is sort of this idea of lock-in, right? You know, these sometimes systems get um, get locked in because of the way that they uh, developed or something, and our, our cognition is very similar, right? Um, <clears throat> one of the things that mental models uh, do, we have them whether we like it or not, right? Um, the problem is that Oftentimes, if we're not doing it intentionally, it's all implicit. Um, they're prone to bias, uh, all of this. And so, you know, by, by taking this almost um, uh, tool usage approach to developing the way that we understand something, right? Um, you following these simple rules of DSRP, um, then we t we, we're, we're less prone to some of those problems in our thinking and we're able to um, construct uh, something that's maybe um, uh, a little bit, what, what might seem like it's out in left field, but actually leads to something profoundly innova innovative, mm -hmm. right? So even like you were just talking about in your story when you were kicking off um, this panel, right? All you did is just, you, you use those rules to find, well, there's gotta be a third connection there, right? right. right. That's just going, I mean, that's, a, that's a, almost a mental model of mental models um, that you, you put into play there, right? Um, you were able to identify, well, there's got to be this, this third thing. It's just because you're able to abstract to this um, almost uh, tool usage sort of approach to the way that you think and analyze. Um, and that can be really innovative and also really simple at the same time. Sometimes all we need to do to innovate something is find that third connection, right? Is to find where something is missing um, and just introduce it. And this is where mental models and DSRP in particular, I think, can be really useful. Yeah, I think it's like the uh, Graham just thinking about 
it's thinking about thinking. It's the metacognition that Derek's always, you know, going on about that we need to be aware of how we're formulating our perspective. And by making us metacognitively aware and, and developing DSRP models is a nice tool to see how we're thinking. It's, a, it's actually a way to take what's in here and put it on paper, uh, you know, per se, and, and to be able to then say, well, what am I missing? Right. What am I not seeing? What part of the way I'm thinking about this problem or this organization or this system am I systematically missing? Because I'm just not asking, what's that third connection? Because the way my mental model of, the, of reality is just omitting or is just missing part of reality. Maybe I'll just quickly add to that. It's sometimes not even what's missing, but how can we reconfigure this, right? So for example, if we take, for example, Uber, here are all the pieces, right? There's taxis, there's phone applications, there's algorithms. Now, how can we reconfigure those to create the application and the verb Uber? It's so simple. We have all the pieces. Just how can we reconfigure it to make something innovative and brand new? And this is kind of the view that entrepreneurs and scientists uh, use, right? They have all the same information as any normal app show, but just the way that they think about it, they create these connections, reconfigure these pieces is what leads to these innovations. And essentially in our book, we are trying to create this algorithm to kind of catalyze innovation. Uh, and that's something uh, I hope is going to be really interesting for everyone. That's a, a great point, Shang. I mean, it, it reminds me of uh, of gerrymandering. I mean, it's it's basically the systems part of DSRP part whole, where you can just by just reorganizing the same things in a different way, you get a different system, right? And 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 so gerrymandering is a kind of classic and probably not uh, positive. Uh, example of that, but you get a very dynamically different system simply by taking the same stuff and organizing it in a different way. I'm wondering what um, what do you all think uh, as we talk about mental models, what do you think is why why the structure and information of mental models is important? Why is it important to sort of distinguish between the informational aspect of the mental model? and the structural aspect of the mental model? Um, I, yeah, I, I think um, there's this one case that you could make, right? When you transfer knowledge, you're actually transferring um, not only information, um, but you should also transfer the structure, which uh, is kind of necessary for the other person to sort of uh, uh, build up the understanding in their in their own minds again, uh, and that sort of really relates to mental models again. I think uh, because if we don't make a conscious effort uh, to to share those mental models with others, uh, there's almost certainly information loss happening uh, when we're communicating ideas or thoughts or just knowledge in general. Um, That's fascinating. Like so, so one thing that I think is interesting is is when we share our knowledge, when we share our information or our, our mental models, it feels like we're sharing what we're thinking and, and but, but our other humans, are they receiving it the way that we're thinking it? Most likely not. Um, well, I mean, yeah. I was actually teaching a class this past semester and um, from what I learned, um, they almost certainly don't receive it the same way. So I actually made a conscious effort to sort of pitch this idea around mental models um, and also how you could sort of leverage that to, you know, go into discussion in your essays about certain topics. And I, I do think um, it helps to make a conscious effort to share those mental models first, to really, uh, you know, talk about the different entities, the relationships and the structure of the system that you're talking about. Um, and then uh, sort of make, try to make sense of the information that's, that's potentially flowing between those entities, right? Uh, Graham uh, was actually on in one of my guest lectures. Uh, he talked about one of the canonical examples, um, structural predictions there. Uh, we talked about urban infrastructure and um, the political system. Uh, and so, yeah, it was, we had a really great discussion there. So I, I do think um, it's, a, it's a great approach. 
to share to try to consciously share mental models before you actually go into like plainly trying to share the information. Yeah, I think Kurt, Kurt, Kurt in the chat just to, to you know interject on that is he was he was saying the you know mental models can hurt or help, right? Like poorly tuned mental models, things that don't align with reality. Or, or things that are intentionally skewing reality. And I think of a lot of you know, propaganda or partisan divide and trying to capture the narrative, right? It's this idea of like, here's some raw information out there, some facts that we can analyze. Well, how can we build up the structure? How can we structure that information into a model that certain people will take and put it in their heads? And then that is the lens through which they see reality. That is knowledge to them now. It's this particular way of structuring information so that they are in line with the greater group's way that they're structuring information. You know, And I think of the heliocentral perspective, once again, uh, from Krakauer, you know, just talking about the Copernican revolution. And no, this is the right way to structure our understanding of, of you know, the heavenly bodies, you know, of saying this is, you know, the sun or the earth, which is it? What's in the center of the universe? Well, that's the way we're structuring information, uh, the, our mental model, and, and what are the political or sociopolitical ramifications if I all of a sudden switch mental models? Well, right. if I all of a sudden change the way I am structuring the raw information? Yeah, and I think, Christian, that, that really, I think, speaks to um, at least one way that mental models can be problematic, right? Even if they are intentionally constructed by somebody. Um, if you're if you're constructing your your mental model in such a way that uh, you're trying to um, fit into a group of people um, or something along those lines, it doesn't. There's no uh, feedback with the environment, with the actual world. In that, instead, your the feedback is sort of with other people, their beliefs, and and sort of the culture in that group. And that there's no guarantee that that you know carves nature at its joints. Right. Instead, you know, and, I, and this is where it's difficult. And I think it's also it's kind of a, a bit of a radical act in a certain sense is to avoid doing that and instead um, be really conscientious about, well, I want my mental model to, you know, uh, match the world I, as closely as possible Go I want to carve nature at the joints. Right. And so you take that information and you just have to do the hard work at that point. Right. Rather than you know, you get some some information or some analysis from the news and you just go, oh, well, that's just the patent truth. Um, and you fit that in there with all your other prior beliefs, you know, these tacit assumptions about the world. Um, and then you just go about your day. Uh, that's a lot more convenient, um, but uh, it's also much more problematic. And I think that's um, certainly one way that mental models can go awry and be, um, uh, yeah, problematic. So we have a... Um, uh... A question from the audience: How to use a, a DSRP to decode the logic of my student thinking? Patrick, you were talking about <laughs> students, and I think most teachers, you know, they they have the experience of there's a big difference between what you cover and what your students understand, and that's really the difference between your mental models going through a pipeline of information and not ending up as mental models on the other side, right? Um. Yeah, so uh, we, what I try to do is I try to encourage them to use, you know, a piece of software that some people might be vaguely familiar with, it's, which is called Plectica, you know, it's just really nice to uh, make, come up with structures of your systems and then maybe like just briefly what is a system, it's um, any, any two parts that are related, right, and so there's a couple of questions or heuristics that you can go through to um, try to keep, decode your thoughts um, and well, you, you, essentially what you do is you try to come up with, this, with the structure of the system um, and the relationships between those entities that you're, that you're dealing with. And this is an iterative process. There's, there, I would almost say that there's no way to get it right the first time. Uh, so you basically, you, you start with two entities, right? You probably have some relation between those two entities because that's what makes it a system. And then you ask yourself, could I break, it, could I break this down more? Or uh, do I need to... Uh, are there any subsystems I need to consider? Are there any relationships that I have, you know, not considered? It goes back to your example that you had earlier. And then one big one that I really try to hammer home is perspective taking, because that's usually one that we really omit. Um, and I think that is also a super interesting one when when we're talking about cogn 
uh, cognitive biases, right? Perspective taking is one of the tools that is super helpful if your goal is to minim minimize cognitive, cognitive biases, which yes. probably uh, should be one of the goals that you should be having. Um, so that's, that's a, a really interesting point because a lot of people, when they talk about perspective taking, they talk about taking more perspectives, but they rarely talk about that they're already taking a perspective and it's their bias, right? And, and so it's not only about uh, getting that bias perspective and understanding and being aware of it, and then also about taking other people's or other groups or other things or other places perspectives. Uh, we have another question here, which is fascinating that that's related to what Graham was saying. Um, how can we know that we understand where nature's joints are so we can carve there? It's a good question. Um, again, I, I think it is sort of an iterative process, right? You, you, you work on developing a mental model and then you need to go out and figure out ways to check it, right? To verify it, to test it. Um, to go back to, you know, the short video that Derek played earlier about, you know, the two water buffalo and the crocodile, right? Um, one of them's testing it. And unfortunately, like Derek said, he, he tested it the wrong way. Ultimately, you know, he should have had the other buffalo go for it. Um, but when it comes to this sort of thing, we don't, we don't have um, a great uh, way, like alternative to just checking it out, seeing how it fits the real world. Um, but typically, I mean, especially when we're talking about complex systems, we've seen already today a lot of instances where simple rules actually do a lot of the legwork, right? So a lot of these things, it's not, it doesn't have to be sent anything terribly complicated um, in order to be able to model something that is deeply, profoundly complicated, yeah. right? So <clears throat> maybe a good rule of thumb is to approach it just you know, keep it simple, stupid, right? <laughs> Try to keep it as, as simple, as straightforward as possible and then go chest and then it refine. Um, and that's all we can really, as far as I'm aware, I think that's that's all we really have at our disposal. Yeah, I think to piggyback on that, when we're doing DSRP, we're creating these, we're trying to visualize what's going on in our head, the way we're actually seeing the world and, and trying to become, take second person perspectives, third person perspectives around different parts of the system and different uh, other elements in the system. Really, like what Graham is saying, what we're what we're doing is we're not just trying to create the, the structure to just see a structure. We're trying to understand the processes yeah. that are flowing through the structure. We're trying to understand what are those those processes that are that are relying on that structure. So the structure is almost secondary. It's like it's the thing that we start with, but what we're trying to do is we're peeling back the processes to the processes, and then what Graham had just said is what are those learning rules or like. David was saying that generate or motivate those processes. We could find those like underlying rules that motivate the processes that then uh, arrange the structure that give the system life. You know, that is the goal. And, and then it becomes iterative in the sense of, oh, I understand the rules or I understand the processes and what the system's trying to do. What am I going to do about it? What, what needs to happen now to add new processes or change the processes or the change the structure and or how can I interact? How can I change the interaction role? Yeah, Christian, there was a, a really, um, there was kind of a, a, a great moment in D David Krakauer's talk where he he actually said, he showed us a picture of, of the constitution, the kind of the mental model that he had with the interactions. It was like four circles with some relationships and uh, and then he said, so, so you, his words were, so you concept it and then you mathematize it. And so mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of times people think, well, oh, the, the, you know, the math is pretty complex and it's hard to, you know, the, you, I must need to do all that stuff. But the, the hard work was in the, in the conceptualizing it. And then the, the, the mathematizing it is just sort of the drilling into it in a technical way for technical purposes. But but that model is just being mathematized, right? So it, it, it's, it, if that model's wrong, then the math's going to be wrong. And so it's not about the maths, it's about the, the model. Um, and I think that's really important for, uh, for, especially for a very diverse audience that, as David said, you know, you can, you can approach these things mathematically or, or not. You can do complexity without any math and you can do it in an everyday way with your kids or at home or, you know, whatever. 
Um, talk a little bit about that uh, because I know you guys do both. You, you're you're able to span both those worlds, but it's not necessary. Yeah, maybe I can use example from my research. That's okay. So I do a lot of research in basically data-driven digital agriculture. Uh, so putting technology onto a farm. So you know, how do you do that? How do you do so in a way that actually uh, drives the increase of uh, food supply to meet the demand by 2050? And in 2050, we're gonna need an estimated 70 to 75% increase in food supply to meet the growing swollen population. That's huge. You know, how do we do that? So let's think about this first uh, qualitatively. Qualitatively, you have to actually be able to define who are the stakeholders in the system. Extension agents, farmers, uh, food supply, uh, seed suppliers, uh, producers. Like there are various actual elements and stakeholders in the system that you need to be able to define and then understand what they need in terms of a, a future farming system. Um, and after you do that, you can actually really simply incorporate it with, for example, if you have a automated irrigation system, perhaps it's super cool, super interesting, it can increase your yield by 50%. But if farmers don't use it, what is the point of that system? So very easily, you ask the farmer, what is it gonna take for you to use the system? Oh, hey, I need this in the actual text format because I don't have a computer. Oh, okay, great. So send a text message to them so they can understand what's going on in their farm. A super easy qualitative thing for you to actually find out. Now, let, let, very quickly, I don't wanna come on like this talk or talk all about my research, but how do we do this now quantitatively? So we can maybe define metrics. What are the metrics that a farm needs to hit, right? Maybe they need to grow X amount to uh, maintain X profitability to keep the farm going. And maybe they can only tolerate X amount of risk, right? They can only tolerate these uh, farming sensors failing 50% of the time. Great, we understand that. We can have a, a sensor that fails greater than 50%. And then maybe last, uh, they're really worried about, for example, climate change. Well, there are actually models to actually define and to algorithmically predict what climate change will be. And then we can link that to actually how it will affect the farmer. And so these are also ways that we incorporate actual numbers uh, to uh, building these future farm systems to kind of, for lack of a better saying, feed the world. That's fantastic. Uh, really great examples. I think, I think that'll, uh, that provides a, a great uh, connection to, the, to understanding kind of what we're, what we're all about. I, did, I just got a question that, um, that I think we need to transition into, which is, um, uh, I lost it though, where is it? It was basically, um, oh geez. Oh, what, what do you talk about specifically in the book? And can you provide sort of a summary or a table of con uh, contents, for instance? So we'll kind of move into, uh, you know, what, what, what exactly will we be trying to accomplish in the book and, and, um, and talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'll take that because um, I'm excited to talk about this too. I'm like waiting. I'm like, okay, all right, here we go. So, uh, so we've been talking about a bunch about like knowledge. What is knowledge? Okay, information structure. What are mental models? Okay, these things that we that we create knowledge in the in our minds that we're trying to represent reality of some kind. And and what we're trying to do in the book, uh, what our goal and the aim of the book is to explore different ways to structure information. Um, you could imagine uh, what, what if you woke up this morning and you were unable to make any distinctions, you were unable to see relationships, you're unable to see cause and effect, you were unable to under, to take a perspective, and you're unable to like understand subsystems, right? That's just raw information. You're just looking at the world of chaotic noise at that point, right? You might as well be staring at like the, the old school TVs with the fuzz, you know, the fuzzy screen. Like that's what the world, you would look up in the sky and you'd see like white, you wouldn't even understand what the concept of white is. You would just see random things, right? And that's, this is the world of raw information. And what our brains do is structure that information, right? And we're creating distinctions and relationships and we're seeing causes and effects. And, and what we're doing with the math of innovation is we're exploring 
what are all the different ways that we can go about structuring the world of information in like a raw world space? And what is it, what kind of patterns do we see consistently reemerge through multiple iterations of, of building out world structures of information? Like if you just imagine raw information and you just give it algorithms to say, hey, structure this, structure what makes sense. It do that lots of times. See what happens, see what kinds of structures repeatedly emerge, see what kind of patterns in the structuring repeatedly emerge. And then that can actually inform back to us. Well, what are, what are some common ways that mental models that we should expect, what kind of patterns we should expect to see in our mental models consistently kind of pop up, creep up? Um, and what does that say about innovation? What does it say about discovery and the way we go about uh, structuring the world of information and, and building knowledge? Does that, does that kind of get yes. us somewhere? Yeah, that's fantastic. Others want to take a stab at that? Or, or I, think, I think, I think Christian really, you know, hit the nail on the head. I mean, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at, I mean, we're, we're planning on um, developing a sort of a generative framework, you know, uh, that takes a bunch of raw information and creates um, it, these fairly arbitrary structures around it just to see what sort of regular patterns start to emerge. From that, once we have these sort of patterns following sort of DSRP rules and everything, then we can start um, translating those into different sorts of like computational objects and start doing some neat things there, right? So, you know, <clears throat> what we can do, one thing that I'm excited about um, is, you know, taking like a, this fairly arbitrary DSRP structure after you know, all of this information has been organized and then doing a little bit of uh, network analysis on it just to see, um, you know, what are the most, what are the most central nodes, right, in this network? What, what, what can we learn about the way that this structure dynamically evolved over time? Um, you know, if we find a pattern uh, repeating in a lot of these different things, we'll, we'll, you know, start to hypothesize, why is that? Does that have anything to do with um, the history of how this structure was built, you know, and stuff like that. And then with that sort of information, you know, we hope that uh, we'll be able to learn more about um, the way that we, that real world mental models develop, right? The way that we, that we develop our understanding about the world <clears throat> and how at certain moments, new things pop up, you know, someone uh, has this brilliant idea to, uh, get rid of um, candlelight and start, you know, going over to electric light or something like that, right? We can understand not only the impact that might have long term on this structure, right? Just having this new connection between these things. But then also we can take this and start looking forward and say, well, here are some of the problems that we see in the world, you know, these wicked problems. Um, maybe there's a couple of connections here missing and that's all that's really that we're lacking. Maybe that's all it is. Um, and so we're really excited. I think I'm personally really excited about that move in this sort of process where we, you know, we, we, we go from this analytical framework that we've developed this, this sort of generative uh, um, uh, model and <clears throat> start translating it into, well, what can we learn about the, the world and the way that, you know, our, our inventions, our innovations, our understanding of the world evolves as well. Maybe I can quickly add to that. So uh, going off of Graham's point, the point for me, and I think all the guys on this call know, for me, what's really exciting is the application. So applying this to the most successful companies and startups, you know, how do we understand the structure that they've created to become like the next Apple, a multi-billion dollar market cap? That's insane. Like, how can we recreate that and create the next Apple? That's the structure we need to be able to, to create and put into a new company or a current company to kind of re-energize uh, them and to make them uh, kind of achieve the, their highest potential. And that's essentially what the application of our book is gonna try to solve. For, for, but for a lot of things, not just to be a billion dollar company. I mean, yeah. uh, it can also be applied to educators or you know social policy or anything else, but yeah. I mean, let me yes. clarify. That's what excites me the most. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and let me let me get at the the generative structure a little more. Uh, what's going to be nice about that is 
what we're what we're trying to develop is looking at the downstream effects of saying, hey, what happens if you try to structure raw information with a heavily perspective driven mode of, of developing that model? What happens if you actually remove the ability to take perspectives at all? Or what would happen if you just became a super, you know, distinction heavy, but really light on relationship seeing or making? You know, like if what happens if uh, if all you can do is is see sys like subsystems and nested hierarchies, but you don't actually see the connections, or you don't actually take multiple perspectives? What kind of structures emerge? in that information space and maybe that's getting like a little too abstract eric maybe you want to bring that down a little but yeah. well no i mean what you're talking about we see in the in the actual uh, experimental data and and, and of, of re real humans in in that we see a pattern of what people do the most of and what they do the least of and uh we see that you know it, it kind of we can tell that they're going to make lots of identities, but not always consider the other. They're going to do part whole all day long till the cows come home. <laughs> they're mostly not going to do too much relationships. Uh, if anything, they'll do it just at the top level, but they won't go down a level into the subsystems and relate the parts at the subsystem level. They almost never take perspective when they do. They almost never make it explicit. I mean, we see this in, in, our, in our data. And so what we're going to be doing in this book, what Christian, I think you were just saying is we're going to be modeling that and then being able to tweak the parameters and see what happens in a modeled system when you, when you do that or don't do that or do too much of that or do too little of that. Um, and th there's some really interesting data that can come out of that. Specifically talking about recommender systems, right? Because then you're able to say, Hey, we looked at what you just structured. Probably you should consider more relationships or perspectives or other things that you have underutilized um, given all that we know. I'm, yeah. I'm curious for one or several of you to respond to um, the idea. I think people understand that you can make a structural prediction of, of distinguishing something or part holding something or relating something or you know a, per, a perspective. Um, but what happens when in the models, when you start combining those things? I think that's where that's a step where people uh, sometimes go and, and where there's a lot of richness in terms of innovation. What happens when you combine an R rule with a D rule and an S rule, for example, or a P rule with an S rule? Or Talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so Patrick, I mean, he was just saying like a recommender system, you know, and I think that's kind of what he was you know, circling around is what happens when we start recommending jigs, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, like, hey, your system seems like it's it's uh, missing this common thing with a, with a system similar to yours. You know, the way you're modeling this right now, it looks like there needs to be a, a, this type of jig in it, which is, you know, might have an R and a D and an S or some sort of combination or some sort of P circle, who knows? And so like, uh, yeah, why don't you try that on and see how that works in your mental model and see what that answers as far as the way you're needing to think about or trying to think about, almost like trying a hat on of a mental model and applying it to your system and to see if that, if that increases understanding or increases innovation, right? Oh. I didn't think to see my system through through that perspective. Um, and now that I tried it out, that all of a sudden raised up an idea, exactly getting all the way back to the thing in this conversation with Derek being like, well, what's that third link? You know, you were a recommender system at that point, Derek. You know, you, you yeah. had this, you saw the map, and you just made a suggestion and said, hey, you should try that. And then light bulb, innovation. Excellent. Uh, we, it sounds like we have enough uh, for one more question. Let's look. Uh, is, the, is your book designed to give the way, truth, and rules for organizations? Are you perspective, prescriptive or descriptive, insights or guide for practitioners? Insights or a guide for practitioners. I think that's like three questions. Is your book designed to give the way, truth, and rules for organizations? That's one. 
Are you prescriptive or descriptive? That's two. And insights, and are you insights or a guide for practitioners? <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take the last that. one first. Yeah. Is yeah. it yeah. insights or yeah, go ahead, Graham. Yeah. So um, you know, I think we're gonna, I mean, this isn't a satisfying answer. I think it'll maybe kick us off, but I think you know, my intuition on this is that we're gonna have to wait and see. <laughs> Um, in part, just because, you know, we've, we've only just really kicked off building this, this generative sort of model, right? And so we need to figure out what exactly um, we can extract from it before we make any sort of choice as to whether we want to be prim primarily prescriptive or descriptive. I mean, I think either way, we could, we'll probably be able to say something interesting and worthwhile. Um, and it just really depends on how, um, how confident we feel being prescriptive. Um, I think that's going to require much, uh, it's a heavier lift in terms of like the actual analysis. Um, but structural but anyway. predictions in general are, are prescriptive. I mean, you know, yeah. Fundamentally, yeah. 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 And I think one easy descriptive thing we'll be able to do is to say, look, just look at the raw numbers of your model that you've built. You don't have, you don't have, based off our kind of analysis, after five distinctions, you need to have at least two perspectives. These types of like claims, you know, to say you really should in order to have proper coverage, like a perspectival coverage of your, of your uh, mental model that you're trying to build out or the way you're thinking about this. I mean, in that sense, it's both, right? You're trying to describe the, uh, the system and then you're also trying to prescribe uh, potential oversights or at least recommending prescriptions around ways to enhance your understanding or alignment with reality in that way. And a great example of that, Christian, is from the, my climbing days is like when you, when you uh, are trying to map and compass, right, and you're trying to figure out where you are, um, you know, there, there's like an infinite number of azimuths that you could take to figure out where you are. But it would be inefficient to keep taking them for infinitely, right? What we know is that if you triangulate, which means you take at least three, that gives you a really pretty good solid position. And so it, it might be the kind of thing where it's like, yeah, there might be 7 million perspectives that you have to take, that you could take, but how many do you really need to take to kind of, to triangulate enough to feel like you're in the right genre, you're like in the right space, that type of thing. Agreed. All right, I think that's uh, it for time. Um, we're very excited to, to work on this project and, and uh, how can people get a hold of us if, uh, if they want to, to uh, I, probably just email us, right? Yeah. Uh, we're all available, DAC66, if you email me, I'll get it to the, to the group. D, uh, sorry, DAC66 at cornell.edu. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks, guys. Uh, that was great. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Derek. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.